This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Good morning, everyone. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Today, we're going to be talking about cancer awareness and prevention and screening. I usually do shows that kind of target one particular type of cancer, maybe a breast cancer show or a colon cancer show, but I wanted to kind of group them all together and talk about the different screening tests that we should be getting, when should we should be getting those, as well as red flags that would kind of signal you maybe it's time to go to your healthcare provider, and then, of course, ways that we can prevent Um, types of different types of cancer. So if you have a question or a comment for us, you can give us a call. Our number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email us fit at mpbonline.org. And you can email us anytime, guys. You don't have to wait until we're on the air. Or you can hop over to Facebook to Healthy Habits with Josie, and you can drop me messages there, and I'm happy to answer them in whichever way you want to send them to me. Last week, um, as we were talking about men's health towards the end of the show, Uh, I was able to bring up um, colon cancer and briefly prostate cancer, and we also talked about testicular cancer a little bit, but we didn't really get to dive into it as much as I wanted to, um, and that's fine. I absolutely love answering whatever questions uh, come in, Uh, but they are so important that I do want to make sure that we we get a little bit deeper into some of those things uh, this week. And so we'll go through the different kind of recommendations in terms of screening for some of these things. Um, But I want to address something that may confuse a lot of folks. Um, It even confuses healthcare providers sometimes. And that is kind of differences in when screening tests start um, based on what website you're looking at. Uh, Sometimes we call that guideline ambiguity uh, because there are differences between what one organization says over another. And they're usually maybe just off by, you know, the age at which something starts by a couple of years. Um, You know, a lot of times, especially if you just kind of Google Um, cancer screening guidelines. It's going to take you to the American Cancer Society's website, which is absolutely fine and a a wonderful place to start. Um, But one that healthcare providers more often use is something called the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, or you may see it abbreviated USPSTF. Um, And that is a, a group of individuals, experts, that look at all of the published evidence uh, around screenings for different things, and then they issue a recommendation and a grade. And by grade, we mean how strong the evidence for or against something is. And some of the grades, they've got an A, B, C, a D, and an I. And so usually things that get a grade of A or B are things that we put into clinical practice uh, routinely because the evidence is so strong to support that recommendation. Um, When things start to get to the the C area, it's more of a uh, judgment about what to do in those areas. And then the D is usually a recommendation against doing something. And then I is insufficient, meaning there's just not enough information out there for them to make a really good recommendation on those types of things. Um, oftentimes, uh, insurance companies will follow the USPSTF guidelines as well about when they you know, kind of start to cover different services and those kinds of things. Um, so that's the one that we kind of look at uh, more often in, in clinical practice is the USPSTF. Um, but regardless of what you're looking at, 
always have a conversation with your healthcare provider. If you think you are approaching the age or past the age at which one of these screening tests should occur, just have that conversation um, with your healthcare provider about when it's right for you to start that particular um, screening test. And when I say screening test, a screening test is usually something that's done when you are asymptomatic, right? Or you feel well, you don't have clinical signs of disease. We're trying to catch it before it happens or catch it at the earliest stage possible when we do a screening test. That's different than a diagnostic test. That's when you may come in to the healthcare provider's office with a particular symptom of something and we order a test to look at that uh, to to kind of confirm or rule out what we think might be going on there. And so those are a little bit different. Usually screening tests are done um, as part of your wellness exam, but they do not have to be. Um, You can always bring those up and talk with us um, at your visits. So the first one I actually want to start with is um, one that we talked about last week, but we kind of had to rush through it. So I want to talk about Uh, colon cancer um, a little bit more uh, because it's in the news a little bit more as well because the screening guidelines have been um, been augmented or or pushed up. And if you go to that USPS um, TF website, some of the things you may see um, is something that says in progress beside it. And so that that means that they are evaluating new evidence that has come out uh, in determining their Uh, new recommendation. But the colorectal cancer screening um, was updated in 2021. So very, very current actually came out May 18th um, for that. And we've got an A and a B recommendation there. And so the we've kind of traditionally always thought about colon cancer screening beginning at age 50. Right. Um, and that's with the, the colonoscopy is how we uh, probably the more, more common um screening tool that you may be familiar with. Um, But we have uh, an updated recommendation that starts at age 45. And so uh, age 45 to 49, um, considering some different screening practices for colon cancer, um, other than just uh, the colonoscopy. And one of the more prevalent options that we have, or one that you may see more about, is uh, the Cologuard test, which is a test that looks for um, kind of genetic evidence of uh, cancer in the stool. And so that can be ordered by your healthcare provider, um, collected at home and mailed back uh, for analysis there. Um, The important thing to remember with any type of screening exam, let's say um, you do a Cologuard test and it comes back uh, positive, or you do, um, some of you may be familiar with the little cards that you've gotten at your doctor's office where you put a little, um, little bit of stool on the card and bring the cards back and we drop some uh, chemical on there and look for a change in color. That's a, uh, called a fecal occult blood test. Any type of screening test like that that comes back positive should be followed up with a colonoscopy. Uh, so uh, I, I say that not to discourage you from getting the test done, but just to prepare you that if something comes back positive, we would want to go ahead and get a colonoscopy because that allows for direct visualization of the area, right? You can actually see the colon and look for things like polyps or ulcers or you know anything else that might be going on in there to cause Um, some of the symptoms you may be having or to cause uh, the blood in your stool or anything like that. But if you're 45 or approaching 45, now is the time to have that kind of beginning conversation with your healthcare provider about your plan for colon cancer screening. Kevin, you got a comment. I see you got your headset on. Um, Yeah, I just wanted to... um comment on a colonoscopy and that uh, I got one, the first one I got done and you had to drink the Go Lightly stuff or whatever it was. And this was years ago. And so it was a large container of it. And it was really, yuck. I mean, it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. Went the colonoscopy and it, they, I think they found something that got uh, actually surgically removed. But it, I got this 
not phobia, but a, um, a blockage to where I wasn't mm-hmm. going to get one again because that stuff was so awful and I didn't want to go through that whole thing again. So I actually put off later than I should have. But finally, it was on Dr. Jimmy's show where he mentioned it and how important they are. And I said to myself, stop being a six-year-old. It's, <laughs> you know, it's one thing. You'll get through it, whatever. Uh, and I did. And uh, this time they found another little small thing that was that was corrected. So I guess my point was that stuff is awful to drink, uh, but it was better this time around than it was the last time. Plus, again, just tell yourself, buck up, stop being a baby and get it done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had two colonoscopies myself. Um, mine were not screening colonoscopies. I was having pain and change in bowel habits and that kind of stuff. So mine were more diagnostic looking for the cause of that. But regardless, the prep was the same. Um, drinking the go lightly, which whoever named it clearly has a sense of humor and we should be friends um, because it is not uh, lightly, but you know, it, it is part of the process. Um, you know, discuss that with your healthcare provider uh, as well. There, there potentially could be, you know, a different type of prep that you could do if you weren't able to tolerate that, but it is the best prep really to get that out. Um, my tips for that is to get it super cold, uh, when you mix it. Um, if it's room temperature, it, it just, it doesn't go down as smooth. Uh, and then they, you can add flavor packets to it. For my personal preference was I did not I did not like the flavor packets um, because it g- gave me a little bit of indigestion and then it just I had that taste in my mouth all the time. So I didn't love the flavor packets. But, you know, if you feel like that would help you, then, you know, consider one of the flavor packets out there. Um, but I just got it super, 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 super cold um, and then just. I mean, just chugged it, you know, when it was time, you know, it's not, it's not a sipping beverage, you know, it's not something to just kick back and enjoy. You really want to just kind of try and get it down, um, without tasting. Cause it's very, very salty tasting, you know, cause it's got different electrolytes. That's the actual lightly part of it is it's different electrolytes in there that are going to pull fluid into your colon and help you clean it out. Right. But it's a very, very important part of the colonoscopy. Um, uh, you mentioned, you know, find, finding a few little things in there. Usually what uh, we find in a colonoscopy is a polyp. Um, and so a polyp is almost like just a little pooch out of tissue, like a little um, little node of tissue. And those can be precancerous or the type of cell that has made that polyp, um, if left un left in there to continue to grow could potentially turn into something cancerous. And so usually what they do, they take those out uh, and they actually tattoo in the area. They put a little, a little tattoo mark in there so that when you have your next colonoscopy, they can see where that polyp was to see if it you know grew back or there were any changes in that particular area. Um, and they send that polyp off for a pathology report so that they can see what type of cell that is. And that's when they decide whether, um, uh, you know, how quickly you're going to need a repeat colonoscopy. You know, normal screening colonoscopies um, are usually every 10 years. So you go in, you have your colonoscopy, everything looks good in there. You know, there's nothing to be removed. 10 years is the recommendation on that, depending on your family history, as well as um, uh, the number of polyps that were found, what type of uh, pathology report comes back on that, you may have more frequent colonoscopies every two to three years or every five years, something like that. And that's something that I ask patients when they come in, you know, to see me for a preventive medicine visit. We, you go, when was your last colonoscopy? What did it show? Um, when's your next one scheduled? And that's the answer that a lot of people don't know. They're like, hmm, I don't really remember, right? And probably they probably didn't tell you at the time that you finished the colonoscopy because they're waiting on that pathology report. So it's usually in the letter that they mail you that has your results as to when your follow-up is due. But if you don't know, just call where you had it done and, and make sure that you've got that information down so that you stay on track with that. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. 
For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. for tuning in today. You're listening to Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. And we're talking about colon can uh, not just colon cancer, we're talking about cancer screening, uh, awareness and prevention today. If you have a question or a comment for us, our number is 1877 MPB ring. It's 1877-672-7464. And we do have a caller on the line. We'll go to Hancock County and talk with Jack. Good morning, Jack. You're on the air. What can we do for you today? Well, I'd like to follow up and get some answers to my question. Okay. About six or eight weeks ago, I lost my voice Mm -hmm. all of a sudden. I went to my GP, and he didn't like the looks of it, so he sent me to get a chest Mm X-ray. Did a couple of blood tests and a few other things. Went back to see him, said they found something on the chest x-ray, so he sent me to get a CT. Mm -hmm. And I went to get the CT, and it came back, and they said, yeah, there's something maybe down in the lung, maybe up in the throat. We don't know what it is. Okay. So he sent me to see an ENT. Good. And I went to see him, and he diagnosed a paralyzed vocal cord. Okay. But he said that could be a cancerous tumor somewhere on the nerve. Mm -hmm. So they sent me to an oncologist that did a PET scan. Mm -hmm. And the oncologist and the PET scan said that they saw... No signs of cancer. Okay. And they didn't know what it was. Okay. Or what was causing it. And I reviewed that with my primary care physician. And I asked him, well, I need to do any more? Mm -hmm. Or if I need to see the ENT? And he said, well... He was pretty sure it wasn't cancer because the oncologist would have been much more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And he didn't think the ENT could help me. And he said, we just watch it. Hmm. But as you can tell from my voice, ain't nothing happened to make it any better. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what I need to do. Well... You gave a really good history to me. So all the all the questions I was jotting down that I was going to ask you, you gave me all that information. So that's great. And it sounds like they've done a, a pretty good workup uh, on you so far. The, the steps that they've taken were kind of what I was going to be recommending. I probably, you know, from here... Um, the ENT probably would be the the best place to go back um, and and kind of follow up uh, because I can hear your voice. There's you know there's something going on there. It's excellent news that the oncologist doesn't feel like it is cancer, uh, but there can be other things that are not cancerous that could be you know causing that you know that pressure on that vocal cord or different things like that. Um, did your uh, regular doctor say how long y'all were going to watch it before you went back to ENT or anything like that? I have chronic conditions, so I see him every 90 days. Okay. And I okay. guess it's okay. on the 90-day follow-up. Okay, okay. Um, because if it's not getting better at that point, then I think it's you know perfectly appropriate to go back to the ear, nose, and throat doctor um, and – and follow up there to see if there's anything else that they can do to help with that, that hoarseness that you're having. All right. All I'll right. Wait Thank you so much. Doctor next time. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you, very you so much. much for giving us the call. 
All right. We've got uh, Drexel in Byram. Good morning. How can we help you today? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I was just uh, thumbing through my um, TV, and I, I, I stopped on MPB when I hear good talk on the radio there on the station, and I mm-hmm. haven't come. And you were talking about the colonoscopy uh, procedures uh-huh. and stuff like that. And I, I, I don't. I think I heard you say the screening in between the screenings. Did you say 10 years? What was that 10-year thing that you mentioned pertaining to? Yes. So usually in people who are not at increased risk for colon cancer and don't have Uh family history of colon cancer, things like that, usually they will do about 10 years between colonoscopies. If your colonoscopy is stone cold normal um, is usually the amount of time that they will space between uh, colonoscopies. But if they find a polyp or anything like that, oftentimes they will um, make it every five years, things like that, depending on what they find during the, during the colonoscopy. Okay, ma'am, that's spot on right there. That's what my doctor had told me because I had had one back in mm-hmm. 2018, I think it was, or 19. Mm-hmm. And uh, they found two polyps and mm-hmm. extracted And uh, I'm scheduled, I'm up, I'm due for one this year. So I was just, I just wanted to make sure everything was on line with that. Absolutely. I love it when we agree. Uh, (laughs) that we're that we're looking at the right things and thank you for getting your colonoscopy i know it probably wasn't the most fun thing in the world but it's an important screening test well well, to the contrary i mean i i didn't i didn't i really enjoyed it because they 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 dated me with some kind of stuff and Mm -hmm, when i mm -hmm. yeah and that's an excellent point that the actual colonoscopy is not bad at all because you are kind of in kind of twilight slumber with uh, you know, with uh, some anesthesia, it's just drinking that stuff that some people find a little bit difficult, but it's just part yeah. of the process. Uh huh. And I felt so relaxed when I wake when I woke up, and I, I just ooh, I couldn't drive though. My wife had to drive me. But I that's another relaxed. really good point. You got to take a driver with you when you go for your colonoscopy because you will be drowsy and and sluggish. So always make sure that you prepare and take your driver with you. Thank you for giving us a call today. I really appreciate that. All right. We have another caller in Florence. We'll go and talk with Roger. Good morning, Roger. How can I help you? Good morning. Thanks for what you're doing. Again, you all do such a wonderful thing. Uh, Back to the guy with the voice problems. Yeah. I lose my voice about once a day. I have surmised. Now, this is after the same sort of sequence that he went through with all those Mm -hmm. experts. Okay, but back to the original cause, I think, is I have MAC. I think that's mononuclear mononuclear uh, atrium complex. Okay. It's a, it's a lung infection, which mm-hmm. is not terribly rare, but it's not too common. But my pulmonologist at university has, well, I had 20 or so patients with this stuff, and I took a long Oh, two-year regimen of of three powerful antibiotics, and mm-hmm. of course I had to take had to take uh, the uh, the the opposite to keep things manageable. It was miserable; it did no good whatsoever. The X-rays kept showing the same area down deep in the lung, bottom of the lungs, primarily one lung, I think. But anyway, one one lobe. But that is MAC, and it produces. Mm-hmm. A phlegm, which of course, because we're made this way, works its way up. And uh, usually in the mornings, I'll wake up with, uh, after I've moved around a little bit, this stuff will come up and I'll be coughing up the same stuff. And it's been analyzed and it's smack. Mm-hmm. And it's, mm-hmm. it's not contagious, but it is. Uh, a, but a pulmonologist can explain that. This guy may have that. I don't know. <clears throat> but if it keeps happening, he didn't mention that he's coughing up anything. So mm-hmm. it may be totally unrelated. But my symptoms, although right now my voice is, is working, but it's about to wear out after one hour of the day. Uh, so there, there's a, a hint for him possibly, but just mm-hmm. for the edification of your listeners, that there are various things which cause the natural uh, uh, migration of stuff on your lungs, up through your, well, on up onto your vocal cords, 
and you got to clear your throat. And clearing your throat is not good for your vocal cords. I mean, I'm yeah, a, it irritates it. It does. I'm a singer. And I've, I've, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm a wannabe singer. And singing all my life, and and that it it gets in the way. But I've been to ENTs over and over. I've been to the specialist who's recognized as the best in Mississippi. And they don't know what to do about it. You can't do anything about it. So he may have something like that that's been unrecognized. I don't think you can do much about it, but it sure is bad to lose your voice. All right. Uh, thank you again for what you do. That's just my tale. I don't think you know. I love hearing these tales because, I mean, you're you're very correct. There are lots of different things that can cause hoarseness. Infections are one. You mentioned, you know, this MAC, um, which is a mycobacterium infection. Um, the the thing that causes walking pneumonia, mycoplasma, will also cause uh, a hoarseness. Those usually are a little bit more self-limited. And then one of the more common things that I see just in general practice is reflux. Um, at nighttime, you know, as acid kind of splashes back up into um, the, the larynx, it will irritate the vocal cords and cause um cause irritation there and cause hoarseness. So there's lots of different things um, that, that can cause it. My concern with the previous caller was the, just the fact that they had seen something on x-ray um, that needs to be followed up on and looked at. But I really appreciate your, your sharing your story with us and uh, giving us your insight today. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC, and we're talking about cancer awareness and screening and prevention today. If you have a question for us, our number is one eight seven seven mpb ring or you can email us fit at mpbonline.org. Org. We have a couple callers hanging on the line, and right before I hop to them, I just want to close out our cancer, our colon cancer uh, topic with just a few red flags. So if these are things that you um, are experiencing, it's the time to kind of talk to your healthcare provider about uh, how best to move forward and looking for, re- uh, looking for um, anything that might be causing those. And one is unexplained or unintentional weight loss. I know a lot of people call me and or come to see me because they're wanting to lose weight. But if we're not actively trying to lose weight and we are continuing to decline in weight, that is something that should be evaluated by a healthcare provider to, to look for any particular cause of that. In particular, colon cancer um, can cause unexplained or unintentional weight loss. Uh, and then any change in, in bowel habits. Now, this doesn't mean um, one day you have diarrhea. It means that you know, maybe you've never had a problem with constipation before, and now you find yourself dealing with constipation um, pretty regularly, um, or the the shape of your bowel movement changes, or the color of your bowel movement changes to maybe red or dark and tarry. Um, those kinds of things; those all should prompt a conversation with your healthcare provider about figuring out the reason that those things are happening. And they can be caused from things that are not cancerous as well, uh, but we want to get those checked out. All right, let's hop over to our phone lines. We've got a couple callers. Let's go to Pontotoc and talk with Bobby. Good morning, Bobby. How can I help you? How are y'all doing over there today? Well, I just can't complain. Well, uh, uh, I, I want to get off the subject just a minute, if you don't mind. 
uh, there's some doctors in the state of Mississippi carrying on some stuff that somebody needs to do something about, and I don't know who to call to tell about this. Maybe somebody listening in can confirm something. But anyway, uh, I went up here to Pontotoc to the eye clinic to get my eyes examined, and they told me I had a cataract that needed to be took off. So they got me an appointment with the eye clinic over at Oxford to have that eye a cataract took off, and I went over to the appointment, and they would not operate on my eye till I paid them first, so I went ahead and paid them, and everything was going fine until we got in the operating room, and they went to operate on me, and that's when I heard the bad news. They told me they could not operate on me because I had high blood pressure, and that mm-hmm. shocked me, but what was even worse, they wouldn't give me my money back just our clinic up here owes me eighty dollars, and the one over at uh, Oxford owes me eighty-one dollars, and they will not give that money back. But this is what I don't understand: every doctor in the state of Mississippi, when you go to an appointment with them, they examine your blood pressure. And uh, I don't. I think they need to pass a law to make these eye clinics uh, uh, give you a blood pressure test, just like all the other doctors. Don't y'all think that would be? A good idea? Well, now my eye doctor does check my blood pressure, uh, and so does my um, dentist, uh, because there are certain medications that will be that can be given, especially during a surgical procedure, that could cause your blood pressure to go even higher. And so, kind of knowing what those blood pressures are before we start those procedures is important um, to know there. Um, so, well, they don't, neither yeah. one of them clinics. The one over here and the one over there, neither one of them didn't test my blood mm-hmm. pressure till they went to operate on me. And then that's mm-hmm. when they told me, and, and they won't give me my money back either, so I don't know. I think that there should be a law passed making them test your blood pressure when you go in. The uh, eye doctors, just like all the rest of the doctors, all the other doctors I go to for appointment, they test my blood pressure the first thing. But I don't know why these eye doctors don't do that. That's something that they definitely should do. I, I don't know who to get in contact with at Jackson, but somebody needs to do something about that. Hmm. Well, I mean, you bring up a very interesting point. And, you know, the the most important thing we can kind of take away from that is knowing your blood pressure and getting really good control of your blood pressure there. I'm not sure who to point you to either um, to, to kind of address it from a bigger policy issue. Um, but I'll look into some of those things as well and talk to some of my healthcare policy folks and, and see what's going on out there in the world of, of moving uh, to more universal screening of blood pressures before some of these things happen. Well, Thank I you so much you. for giving us a call today um bobby i really appreciate that and i'm sorry that that happened to you i hope you get that um get that taken care of and and get uh get your cataract taken care of there all right let's go down to gulfport and talk with robert good morning robert you're on the air how can i help you good morning i just have two comments to make sure and the one comment do you remember a guy named jack palance mm-hmm Yes, he was the guy in City Slickers. Uh, I think his name mm-hmm. was. But anyway, when when he took the Academy Award, he said, getting old is not for the meek. So that's one comment I have to make. The other comment came from a doctor, and he said that good things get better, bad things get worse. And I just want to share that to you because, you know, the inevitable is coming, and so I guess, you know, in the end of all things, you've got to be right with yourself and your God. Do you disagree? Oh, no, I think we all have to have peace as we move through this life, and, you know, things are going to happen as we move through life, as we move through age, and, you know, making sure that you are comfortable with your process and how you're dealing with things is, is very, very important, you know? Um, because so, something you know, and, that doc- and positivity some is important as well. There's some things that doctors can't cure. And at that mm-hmm. point you have to be at peace, like you said, uh, with your maker. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, as a healthcare provider, 
you know, I try to approach every single person that comes to see me, you know, with my absolute best self, because I have to be at peace as well that I've done, you know, all I can for people interested in into my care. And so that's how, you know, how I practice healthcare every day is knowing that I did my best uh, for every single person, whether they're the first person of the morning or the last person um, of the day or the person that calls me in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, I, I, being positive and making sure that I give my best to everyone is, is one of the ways that I am good with my maker. Well, all right, you know Robert, thank you. A Christmas thank you for your- this year. Pardon? I said a Christmas card for you this year. (laughs) Yes. All right. Thank you so much for giving us a call today. You have a great rest of your week. All right, guys. um, I want to hop over to uh, prostate cancer real quick um, uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, June is Men's Health Month. We talked about that last week. And when we look at um, utilization of healthcare services, Mean, meaning folks who go to the doctor and, and, you know, get wellness exams and those types of things, men in general do tend to seek those services less often than women do. Um, and, you know, there could be a variety of reasons for that. Um, one thing that men often tell me is that they don't want to get their prostate checked is one of the reasons why they don't want to come in and be seen for their wellness exam. Um, well, you know, I, I want to kind of reemphasize the fact that prostate cancer screenings are what we call an informed decision uh, now, meaning we you should have a conversation with your healthcare provider about whether prostate cancer screening, either from a rectal exam or a blood test, is appropriate um, for you based on your age and risk factors there. So we still recommend that you come in. Uh, there are lots of different things that uh, we can check the previous caller, blood pressure, making sure our blood pressure is under really good control and lots of other things that happen during a wellness exam. Um, but that prostate cancer screening is a conversation that we have about your risk for prostate cancer based off of any symptoms you may be having, any family history, other risk factors um, that could be going on there. And we can start with just a, a blood test if that's how you um, want to approach that. Now, if the blood test is elevated, which is the prostate specific antigen, then that may prompt a rectal exam because there are non-cancerous things that can cause elevations in PSA. Those go up as we age. Um, And then also just uh, a benign condition of prostate enlargement that can elevate that sometimes. So we'd want to check that out and be seen. Um, But it's it's definitely not a reason to not come uh, and get a wellness screening done. Um, And just make sure that you discuss those things uh, with your healthcare provider. Now, any kind of red flags that would prompt us um, to absolutely go ahead and check things out would, again, be a change in in bathroom habits. Um, uh, uh, pain with urination, loss of bladder control, um, rectal pain and pressure in the, in the rectal area. And then also change in bowel habits, because as that prostate gets bigger, if there's a, um, a, a mass in that particular area that can put pressure on the, the rectum and kind of make it harder to have a bowel movement. Um, and then kind of new onset erectile dysfunction as well. Um, erectile dysfunction is one of those things that people are often uncomfortable talking about as well, but it is definitely, if you're experiencing difficulty achieving or maintaining an erection, that's something you should share with your healthcare provider um, because it can often indicate um, problems with blood vessels, which could be an indication of advancing heart disease. So those are all super important things um, to be discussing with your healthcare provider uh, to make sure that we do the appropriate screening tests or diagnostic tests if you're actually having symptoms there. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. 
You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. This is Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, and we've been talking about cancer awareness, screening, and prevention today. Um, I'm going to I'm actually going to hop over and talk about lung cancer because I want to make sure we get to that before the end of the show. But we do have a caller on the line um, that will go to Mobile and talk with John. Hi, John. What can we do for you today? Uh, hello, Dr. Bidwell. Thank you very much for taking my call. Sure. Um, could, could you please comment on the value of these uh, tests that are offered to the public? I think they're commercial ventures, and you're uh, told it, you receive an announcement in the mail that at a place in your community, uh, these tests will be available uh, for like a fee of, I think it was, uh, $149. I've got the thing in front of me right now. And um, just to go down the list of what they offer, carotid artery mm-hmm. screening for plaque, heart rhythm screening for atrial fibrillation, abdominal aortic aneurysm screening, peripheral arter- arterial disease screening, and osteoporosis risk mm-hmm. assessment. Uh, can you comment on uh, the value of those offerings? They're not connected with your doctor at all. Yeah. And, um, uh, oh, gosh, I was going to ask another question about it, <laughs> but just go <laughs> ahead with that. I'm getting Yeah, old. so those are our cardiovascular health screening uh, packages, um, and so there are some that are kind of attached to certain hospitals. I know Baptist um, and St. Dominic's both have a kind of a screening package like that that they do, um, but they can give really good useful information. Um, in particular, um, the carotid screening, looking at, you know, any kind of buildup or narrowing of the carotid arteries there. Um, the the AFib as well, oftentimes atrial fibrillation um, has very vague symptoms and people don't kind of perceive the heart racing type of, of situation. They may just feel lightheaded or weak or those types of things. And then also the abdominal aortic aneurysm um, screening, which is a little ultrasound looking at the ab- abdominal aorta, um, because that can, um, uh, and actually it's a recommended screening test for people who have been um, past smokers and, and men and those kinds of things. And so those are all great tests to have. The caveat is that we want to make sure that there is a connection piece between um, getting the tests done, getting the results, and then having follow-up, um, you know, so that if something is abnormal on one of those screening tests, or indeterminate or, you know, and, and doesn't give a, you know, a, a clear cut, this is normal, um, then having the, the counseling piece and the follow-up piece with a healthcare provider to interpret those results um, for you if you have questions about it and then to help with aggressive risk factor modification, um, you know, cholesterol lowering, those types of things. If we're smoking, stopping, um, you know, cessation of smoking and those kinds of things. But they can give you value, valuable information. We just want to make sure that we take those results and talk with them, you know, with a healthcare provider to, to follow up on those results there. Uh, in the small print, they they really leave uh, informing the doctor to you. Uh, but mm-hmm. I was wondering, uh, I've never been offered these uh, or had them mentioned at my uh, GP's office. And can you tell me why they wouldn't do that? Well, well so things like the, the carotid ultrasound are, are not kind of a, based on the evidence that's out there, kind of a, a recommended screening tool um, for folks unless they're in a certain risk group. Um, and then, of course, the, the aortic aneurysm is a, a set of recommendations as well based off of age and um, some other smoking habits and those kinds of things. So if you didn't fall into one of those categories, that's probably why it wasn't brought up. Um, by your health care provider. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, then. You're so welcome. Thank you for giving us a call. All right. Briefly, I want to get to lung cancer. I'm going to skip over cervical and breast, not because they are not crucially important, but because I know we have a wonderful women's health program on uh, on MPB, and I know that they cover those things, and I can always bring them up in the future. But just like the abdominal um, aortic aneurysm screening tool, um, the lung cancer screening may be one that we're not as familiar with as well. 
and it is a low dose CT scan screening. Um, and it is for a certain uh, set of folks. So not everybody would get this. Um, but folks between about age 50 and 80, and again, this is depending on which guidelines you look at, American Cancer Society versus um, USPSTF. Um, but for the um, Preventative Service Task Force, um, between the ages of 50 and 80, and a 20-year pack history of smoking, okay, um, and either currently smoking or have stopped in the last 15 years with that 20-pack year. There are multiple calculators um, that you can Google about how to calculate your pack year history to see if you would fall in that. Um, it, it, tr truly, a 20-pack year would be one pack a day for 20 years, or you could double that. If you did two packs a day, that would be two packs a day for 10 years, that type of thing. But you can go to the calculators and put that in. So age 50 to 80, currently smoking or quit in the last 15 years with a 20 pack year history would qualify um, for this. Uh, and the American Cancer Society says 55 to 74 with a 30 year. Um, so there's a little bit of variability there. But if you're a current smoker or have quit in the last 15 years, having that conversation with your healthcare provider about whether you would qualify for a low dose CT scan um, is not out of the realm of necessity. Uh, and that's a, a yearly uh, screening that gets done to look for any changes there. So what are red flags that would prompt us to be concerned about lung cancer? Well, I mentioned weight loss or unintentional weight loss when we were talking about colon cancer, and the same applies here. Um, shortness of breath. Um, cough that doesn't go away or gets worse, okay, um, outside of having an infection, something like that. Frequent infections, frequent respiratory infections like bronchitis or pneumonia that um, are difficult to get rid of. And kind of as soon as you get rid of it, you, you get reinfected again. Bloody or rust colored sputum um, or and other things. And then chest pain, particularly when we cough or deep breathe or things like that are all kind of general things that should prompt a discussion with your healthcare provider about that, especially if you are a current or a past smoker. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Thanks for listening to the Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit Podcast. If you have a question, you can email fit at mpbonline.org or leave a comment on my Facebook page, Healthy Habits with Josie. For ongoing information on staying healthy and fit, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org.